And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And I think we got all three this week. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, this past weekend, gamers around the world took part in a charity gaming marathon called Extra Life. Uh, this huge gaming event raises money for the Children's Miracle Network Hospital. Here in Windsor, the entire Bellhop team spent pretty much the entire weekend volunteering and taking part in our local Extra Life event held at the CG Realm. Games were played, baked goods were sold and consumed, coffee was drunk, auctions happened, and we raised a lot of money for a good cause. Absolutely. Now, I want to say to anyone who happened to have been online and tried to donate and ran into some problems, I want to apologize. There were some bad actors who became involved with the Extra Life uh, website and were causing issues. Uh, please, if you did try to donate, and we apologize if there were any problems, but I would like to mention that you still can donate all the way up until December 31st. So just because the event is over, money can still be donated to the cause at uh, windsorextralife.com. Yeah, it they, they was... I've had complaints from people who tried to donate. So we are we are still obviously accepting donations all the way up until the end of the year. And even after that, we'll start raising for next year. So in uh, our effort to answer your gaming and game night questions, the answer, the question that we are answering tonight is how did we do during the Windsor Extra Life Gaming Charity, Charity Gaming Weekend? Part of it is we did not get enough sleep, which is probably why this episode sounds a little more rough than our usual. <laughs> Uh, this past weekend, the awesome gamers of Windsor, Ontario, as long with some very much appreciated online donations coming from actually all over the world, managed to raise over $5,000 at our Charity Gaming Marathon this year. Now, I'm going to break it down just a little bit, not going to get into all the details, but the biggest fundraiser of the year, uh, every year, and this year not excluded, is our Geek and Gaming Auctions. Uh, these feature new and used games and other geeky items. Uh, this year, we had a ton of great donations from the local community, as well as donations from 16 different game publishers who provided sealed games for the auction. Huge shout out to Neil Helmler for doing the work to contact those companies. Uh, this year, the live auction itself raised over $2,400, and the silent auction raised just over half that at about $1,200. Saturday, we had the local Artemis team on site. Uh, they were showing off the awesome Artemis Starship Bridge Simulator. Uh, this is basically a Starship LARP played on laptops and computers. Very neat thing. They had a special scenario going for us over the weekend. They were getting new people to play. They raised money online as well as accepting donations on site and raised us over $200. So thanks, Artemis. Now, on Sunday morning... Uh, fresh and early and, uh, and, and fresh off the, uh, the overnight crew, Solon of Tabletop Renaissance hosted an X-Wing tournament featuring, pr featuring prizes from Asmodee Canada, which brought in over $180. Another big thing that was going on all weekend were some great RPG tables. Uh, there was Siren Tuzno was running, Kieran Tuzno was running a D&D game for a ridiculous number of hours. Um, with some help and co-DMs running that. Kevin Doak had a fantastic 3D ziggurat there running through a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game that ran for over 11 hours. Uh, Jeff Seuss ran a couple of great Dungeon Call Classic games. Altogether, they raised over $100, mostly from people cheating to keep their characters alive. And there had to be a lot of cheating, because when I saw the bottom of that ziggurat, there were a lot of lesser demons running around in there. <laughs> And then there was all the other stuff, the bake sale. Um, Brent, who set up a little portable escape room, the board game Bliss gift card raffle, cash donations, and of course, cheat jars. Uh, in total, we actually raised over $5,100 this past weekend, and I couldn't be more proud of everyone. Yeah. Now, a big thanks to our sponsors. So, you want to... All right, this is going to be a big list, but I think all these people deserve to be heard and to know about. So, of course, the CG Realm, our uh, our venue for the year, Hidden Trail Escape Room, the Coffee Exchange, who actually let us go pick up more coffee at 11 o'clock at night, uh, the Broadswords All-Woman Podcasting Crew, 
the Tabletop Bellhop team, Level 99 Games, First Frontier Logistics, Easy Mode Esports Lounge, Geek Life Blog, Spartan Sling, Board Game Bliss, Odd Bird, Industrial Tool and Supplies, Garfield Games, GMT Games, Parallel Games, Far Off Games, MSI, Mind Clash Games, Green Feet Games, Chip Theory Games, Ares Games, Atlas Games, Weird City Games, Leader Games, Albers Tool and Mold, Stronghold Games, 3D Game Shop, Steve Jackson Games, and CLM. That's right. And those are all the companies who helped make this another fantastic year of extra life. We broadcast the entire uh, day. I think we, we ended up crashing out about... 33.5 hours is what the stream said. Is that what it says? So we, we actually, we, we, we crashed a little bit earlier than I, than I wanted to, I know, because uh, at the, towards the end, I didn't go over and hit a button on the camera. So I think the battery on it died a little bit, a little ah. bit before we actually uh, shut it all down. But I think we were within 15 minutes of going from start to finish non-stop no drop frames of the entire um uh, the entire show uh we had uh, one wide shot set up the entire event so that you could see what was going on and every once in a while we zoomed in on some various games or put a roaming cam out on a table to see what was going on uh it wasn't quite as involved as i was wishing we had but i think we got a very good coverage and uh it was a great start for uh you know what is you know a continually evolving stream for the extra life. Uh... Yeah. And I do have to thank everyone who stopped by the stream. We did have some chatters in there. We did get a couple donations while the stream was up. So I don't know if they came from the stream or through Twitter or something else uh, for people to stop by. The only thing I'd like to do is I'd like to somehow make it more interactive next year, but I'm just not sure how to do that. Yeah. How to keep people's interest. Like I get it. You guys are all doing your own extra life thing. And maybe you don't want to look at what everyone's doing in the CG realm, but I don't know, some ways we can try to have people influence a game. I think next year what we need to do is schedule specific events so that at this time we are going to stream the tabletop bellhop team playing Cthulhu Death May Die. Yep. Spend money to cheat on their behalf or something, right? Like we need, I think we need highlight features yep. to do it. And I think that might make it at least get people for that time period. All right. So what games got played at the Windsor Extra Life event? Yeah, well, raising money is nice and helping the kids is awesome. Uh, the local Extra Life event is also a great chance for uh, locals to play some games. And it's a fantastic way to meet and game with new people. I met a bunch of local gamers I'd never met before and got to play a huge variety of games over the weekend. And that was awesome. And I'm really hoping to see some of the people I'd never seen before come out to some of our future events. We do do events at the CG Realm twice a month, and we're also at easy mode fairly often. Now, I started off the event with, um, after getting everything unloaded and set up, ready to go Saturday, the first game I played was Go Cuckoo. I just wanted something light, and I wanted to get something to the table and get going. I figured this was a fitting start to a charity gaming marathon. Uh, yet again, I was teaching the game to some experienced gamers who had never played it before. And as always with this game, it went over extremely well. Everyone loved it, and... I saw many games of Go Cuckoo get played over the weekend. It's really hard not to love Go Cuckoo. We sold at least two copies from uh, uh, at, at the, the store, store, sold at least two copies this weekend because it really is just that much fun. Uh, and we played it again. We you played it first thing after we were all set up, but then we got it to the table again later on in the middle of the night when we were all <laughs> a, little, uh, a little punchy and it was still a great fun game. So it's just, you know, it's just one of those games to keep in your back pocket. It's that much fun. Now, there was a ton of other games going on. I got to say Saturday was packed. That was probably the best Saturday we've seen for Extra Life. There was a ton of stuff. Um, a friend of mine, Steve, brought his copy of Too Many Bones. They had that going. Neil, a uh, local heavy gamer, was teaching Tricarion. Uh, there was the D&D group I already mentioned that played for at least 24 hours. I don't know when they stopped because I did take a nap at one point, but they gamed for at least 24 hours. Uh, I mentioned Doke Ziggurat was set up. He was trying to get people to play. Uh, there was a lot of going on and a lot of different options. Now, the next one I actually sat down to play, I sat down with Sean, was the new Minecraft Builders and Biomes game from Ravensburger. Now, this is a review copy that I got because Sean wanted to see the game, of all things. he Sean from Hamilton, uh, Sean right over there, and noted he wanted to try it. So he's the one that hooked me up with a press contact from Ravensburger, and I got to thank them because they were more than happy to send me a copy. 
Absolutely. I, you know, I think this was this is one game that I was interested in trying because as we've talked about on the show in the past, I have tried the Minecraft card game and I feel sorry to anyone who else who has. Uh, it, it bears no resemblance to Minecraft. It is at the very most, uh, at best, it is a, you know, re-themed something else that re-themed by someone who's never played the card, the card games. Uh, yeah. Whereas this, well, I think there are some questions as to how Minecraft linked it really is. Um, it, it's definitely along the right theme. Uh, and, and it was a much more solid game than I think either one of us expected, really. Yeah, I gotta say, it was a solid game. It, it, it's a tile drafting game where you're buying the tiles by having the right resources. You get the resources from mining them from a big cube of individual blocks that really tied in the, the Minecraft thing there. Uh, it, it's neat. You, you make this cube at the beginning, you get cubes off it, you build stuff. Uh, the big thing here that was surprising to me, though, that it is all about long-term planning. There are three scoring phases of the game, each of which you're looking to have different types of tiles in your playing area. And planning ahead was a big part of the scoring in this. It was really solid for a licensed game, way better than any other Minecraft game I've seen. Now, I do worry that to appeal to the mass market, to the Minecraft fans, this might be a bit too crunchy. That whole strategy of having to plan three scoring phases ahead may be a bit much. Plus, I don't think it's deep enough for hardcore gamers because it's still fairly light. So it's kind of in that limbo in between. So I don't know. Personally, I think if you're a Minecraft fan, check this out. If you're not a Minecraft fan, I think this is definitely a play before you buy. Try it out first because there may not be enough there yeah. for you. I, I actually am starting to lean towards the idea that this could be a gateway game for Minecraft That's... players. Um, I think after, I, I suspect that my kids could probably figure out the thinking ahead after mm -hmm. playing a few times. It's going to be rough the first couple of times. And, you know, I would stomp all over them because they just aren't ready to think that far ahead. Right. But I do think that after a, a little bit of experience, the kids would pick that up and would have that gamer mindset of planning mm -hmm. ahead. And that's not a bad thing. But no, your kids are basically gamers at this point because they yeah. played the Duke and they played deck builders and they, they, they know some of the mechanics. So They do, but I, 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 I think in general. I mean, Minecraft gamers are, you know, Minecraft players are gamers. It is not, a, it is not an easy game if you get into the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of it. That's true. So, you know. Yeah, I just, I, I wonder where this one's going to sit. I, I have a feeling it's probably going to flounder and not do well, which is sad because I think a lot of people are going to look at it and just think it's going to be a garbage game. Right. And that's not the problem with it. It's not that it's a bad game. Yep. I just worry about how approachable it is for different groups. Uh, the next game I actually played was Gold West. Again, Sean played this one. Actually, interestingly enough, both Sean's this played this one. So we had Sean from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton at the same table with Deanna and I. We played a four-player game. Uh, at this point, it's only my second time playing Gold West. But this was my first play with more than two players, and I was very impressed. The game is surprisingly easy to teach. Uh, I'm really happy with how quick I can get that one out there. It looks a little overwhelming at first, but it's an abstract with really simple uh, simple icons, simple to see stuff. Uh, my main complaint last time I talked about this game was the fact that we played two-player, and it features area majority. And area majority doesn't work great with two people. Well, thankfully, with three and four players, it works great. So having more than two players really made the game shine even better. Uh, I got to say there was some really fierce competition for investment cards. And man, was in game end game scoring majorities. I have never seen an area majority game with that many ties and splitting of points. I I think, in my opinion, I didn't actually go around the table, but I think everyone who played uh, had a good time and had positive things to say about the game. And all of us agreed we got to play again later, though we never actually did play again during extra life. Yeah, no, it was it was a really fun game, and I I have to say it was really easy to pick up. Uh, again, I don't always do well picking up those uh the, the the brainy thinky games too fast this one was not a problem uh my only problem was i i sort of uh didn't pace myself i shot ahead to an early lead uh and then floundered uh sort of mid game and uh, i mean we, we all pulled up it was it was a short it was a close game i think uh mm -hmm. end scoring uh but i've i definitely fell back after taking an early lead because again i'd flounder i'd sort of overspent myself early and got myself into some trouble yeah, you grabbed a couple early investments at the the penalty of not getting the area majorities or the yeah. the coaching tracks. Yeah, but no, definitely uh, this, a good game. 
Yeah. At this point on Saturday, Doak Ziggurat was being explored. He got a local group. He got a bunch of players, which was awesome. Uh, the Artemis crew showed up and had their bridge simulator going. Uh, bids were rolling in for the silent auction, and we had pretty much a full house. Uh, we actually had a large group of casual gamers show up, which was cool. Uh, no problem with casual gamers. Uh, store copies of Monopoly, and the game of life got some good use. Uh, there was a second D&D table set up. There were some Yu-Gi-Oh! players, took over part of the sandwich shop. And to be honest, we actually had a slight problem here where we had a group show up where there was no table to play at. In a way, this is a good problem to have. Uh, we did manage to move some things around and find them a spot, but man, the place was hopping on Saturday. And I, I think overall it was a good thing. It wasn't at the point where we had to turn anyone away, but it was getting close to that that border. Yeah, it was it was busy and it was great because uh, again, coffee and uh, bake sale were going really yeah, well when you've got well. that many uh, folks around. Yeah, it was nice. We had people showing up saying, how can I spend money? How can I give you guys money? And I'm like, well, you can give us money, but <laughs> if you want, buy baked goods, buy coffee, cheat, stuff like that. Yep. Um, just as Jeff's Dungeon Crawl Classics game was getting started, uh, Chad broke out underwater cities. I sat down with Stacy and her granddaughter and taught them how to play Monster Factory. Now, we didn't get a ton of kids out for this event. We did have some, and I was really glad someone gave me the heads up ahead of time to, hey, be sure to pick at the be sure to pack some kids games and we did and i'm glad i did uh stacy and her granddaughter really love monster factory though i gotta admit stacy and even more so cav were a little mad at me for uh showing them a christmas gift they now had to buy <laughs> um but i did have fun playing with them and it was good to see kids out uh speaking of kids shortly after that my kids showed up with uh, my mother-in-law and this worked out well because what i did is i just hooked them up with stacy and her granddaughter and my kids started teaching them how to play games um, they played some Battleship and some other kids' games. Uh, looking around the room, I took a bit of break from gaming. I saw some Terraforming Mars, uh, Quacks of Quedlinburg. There was some ghost stories. Um, Chad was showing off Abomination, Heir to Frankenstein. I did see that Minecraft card game played. I even made a note to go over and show them the other game, but by the time I had a chance, they were gone. It was good. It, it, there was a good mix of games. I think at that point you were mainly streaming. Deanna was working on getting stuff set up for the the auctions at that point. Yeah, no, there was uh, there was still a, an awful lot of work uh, that Dee had to do, and and she worked like a champion throughout. I don't think we definitely couldn't have managed that uh, without her keeping on top of the uh, both the items and the uh, uh, the baked goods and coffee yeah. along the way. Next game I broke out was another Ravensburger game. Uh, when we wrote Ravensburger asking to review the Minecraft game, they asked if there's anything else I wanted to check out and sent me everything I asked for. So thank you, Ravensburger. One of those games was Horrified. Uh, this is the hot new co-op game featuring the Universal Monsters. Uh, this was my first time playing and teaching it. That was interesting because it was almost a read the rule book and teach it. I had kind of flipped through it ahead of time. Uh, this is a co-op game. We set up a five-player game, but then one of the players had to leave because he was sharing pictures of the ziggurat on his phone, and the person he was sharing the pictures to had to come to the store and see it. So not a bad reason to lose a player. So we played a four-player game. Um, this is a very well-produced and neat game. Uh, they did amazing work getting the aesthetic to work. Um, Hand-drawn art instead of um, screenshots, which I thought was really cool. Uh, basically in this game, you're moving around the map trying to collect items. The items are in three different colors and they're of various numeric values. What you do with these items totally depends on which monsters you're fighting. So in this game, we are collecting red items to smash Dracula's coffins and then yellow items to defeat him, which are holy items. And at the same time, we are looking for sets of all three colors to try to discover the home of the creature from the Black Lagoon and drive him off. Now this game... Reminds me a bit of Cthulhu in Shadows Over Camelot because the player takes an action and then you draw from a monster deck and the monsters go. So that seems to be a new thing for co-ops. It's kind of see cool to see that mechanic come back because I originally saw it in Shadows Over Camelot years ago. There is a ton of hype out there for this game. And at this point, I've actually played more than just that Saturday at this point. I got to say it's justified. The hype out there, the hype is real. I have to say, yeah, I agree. We uh, Are we going to cover the additional plays or are we going to leave that for next week? I, I might leave it for next week because we did not game on Monday, so I won't have anything else to talk about. But if you want to, feel free. Oh, no, that's fine. We can keep going. Yeah, we have played more since since that Saturday. Yeah, because otherwise, I don't know if I'll have anything to talk about next week. It'll be like, <laughs> no one came over on Monday because we were all burnt out from Extra Life. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in here, I couldn't tell you the exact time, Brent from Hidden Trail Escape Room showed up and set up a portable escape room in the back. 
uh, challenging people to solve his puzzles while raising money for the cause. Uh, this was up and open right until the auction started, and as far as I could tell, the response seemed pretty positive. Unfortunately, he was only able to be there up until the auction, and Sean, Deanna, and I just didn't have a chance to try it out. I would have liked to have gotten that in there. I know uh, Kator were in there, and they really enjoyed uh, the time they had. Now, after Horrified, I met up with Dave Garby, who people may know from the Wargaming Tradecraft website, where Dave talks about miniature painting tips and modeling tips. Uh, Dave used to be a Windsor local, but he moved to Kitchener some years back. And I got to say, I love the fact that Dave comes back to Windsor for events like this and still keeps in touch. Uh, the main thing Dave was down for is he is an ambassador, basically, for Gaslands now. Gaslands is a post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game that uses Hot Wheels matchbox cards. And that is what I got to play next. Dave set up some really neat-looking industrial scenery on a 3 by 4 wargaming table, had each of us make really basic cars, like all our cars were identical, but we picked which side our machine gun went on, uh, and then set up a track that had three gates. Um, it's really interesting system that's obviously based on X-Wing. The gear you pick, the gear you're in, determines which templates you can use. You then roll dice. Those can give you a chance to do things like change gears up or down. Uh, the, some of the dice could cause your car to spin out or slide or cause you to take hazard tokens. If you take too many hazard tokens, you lose control of your vehicle. The neat part is the slides and the spins you may want to do. And that's where you can pull off some really neat maneuvers, basically like drifting. The goal is to be the first player through all the gates and touch the finish line or be the last man standing, which I thought was interesting. And when we were playing, actually, Steve Joannis was so long, took him so long to get through the first gate. He's like, screw it. He's going to go a different way and just try to take us all out. Unfortunately, we never got to see the end of the game because we had to pause it for the live auction. I had hoped to return to the game after the auction, but uh, at that point, it got too late for a couple of the players, and they went home. So we called that game a draw. I got to say, though, overall, Gaslands looks cool. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was definitely uh, an eye catcher. Uh, they had some uh, some really cool, uh, big electric, uh, you know, Frankenstein style switches set up on the table as part of the the scenery set around and big metal metal hunks sitting on the table. Uh, and so it looked great, really caught the eye, uh, and uh, I think it drew a lot of people over to see, oh, what the heck is this going on over here? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be something that'll grow now in Windsor because part of this was um, Dave was trying to teach Steve Joannis a bit better of the rules and how to teach the game so we can start having some local game nights. Right. Overall, I found the, the, the game itself was more approachable than I thought. This is not Car Wars. This is not a super heavy miniature game with lots of points to worry about and building armies or anything like that. And there was a lot more going on than the templates and the dice that I thought. Like the way like you can actually try to skid on purpose and that I found rather neat. I'm going to try to make it out some local Glassland nights in the future, I think. Excellent. Now, our live auction is always a big draw. Uh, it also tends to be the unofficial end of day one for a lot of locals. So once the auction was done, I got to admit most of the crowd headed home, regretfully. I would have preferred if people had stayed. Um, but many of the gamers who are there to game for 24 hours, what they'll do is split up the time, and we're perfectly cool with this. We don't require people to do 24 hours straight. It's not good for your health. So the auction tends to be the good breaking point for most people. Uh, plus, those who aren't doing the marathon, it's getting late. It was 9, 9.30 at night at that point. So we lost a lot of people at that point, but it happens. First game I played after the auction was Jaws. Uh, this is another one from Ravensburger. Again, thank you for the review copy. Uh, Jaws is a one versus many board game similar to games like Letters from Whitechapel and Scotland Yard. Plays a max of four players with one player playing the shark. Game split over two phases, which... Interestingly enough, kind of felt like playing two separate games. And how well you do in the first part directly influences the second. It was kind of an interesting game. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it was fun. I have to say, I mean, you know, I enjoyed that play. Um, it was very thematic. Uh, you're playing either the shark or the mayor or the police chief or the, uh, the, um, the fisherman um, from the movie. Uh, you don't have to know the movie. No, there's no real yeah, need. I didn't. Yeah, Mo's, Mo's never seen the movie. You don't have to, uh, and it doesn't really help if you do, uh, other than in the thematic sense. Uh, you know, the the you know some of the places on the board, the look of the ship, make uh, 
make more sense. The barrels make a little bit more sense if you if you've seen the yeah. movie. Uh, but there's no need to have seen the movie. Uh, the problem for me is uh, maybe it's because I'm not a big enough Jaws fan. I don't feel like I have any real interest in getting it back to the table. It was enjoyable. I enjoyed that one yeah. play, but unless I were to play the shark, just as to try something, try the, the one other the one other way, way to play that game, um, I was done with it after that play. Fair enough. When we played it, so phase one is the players trying to find the shark. And attached two barrels to it, which someone had to explain what was going on there. You want to float <laughs> near the surface or whatever. And then the shark's trying to eat as many swimmers as possible. And this uses your whole Scotland Yard thing where someone's using a hidden screen like a book and writing down where they're going. And everyone's got to try to deduce where the shark is. The second phase, the shark's attacking the boat. And the shark's trying to either eat the people or destroy the boat. And the people on the boat are trying to predict where the shark's going to pop up. That was basically the two different phases of the game. And I thought it was interesting. Um it definitely felt like playing two different games in a row, which was oh, kind of cool. Uh, and, since Ryan's in the chat room, we should point out it didn't come with a pencil. No, it did not. <laughs> it did not. You had to write, it and it didn't come with a pencil. With a pencil. Uh, I don't know. Like, uh, What's funny, uh, what I think unique about this game is I kept thinking if this was the 90s or the 80s, this would have been two separate games. You would have bought Jaws, Find the Shark, and you would have bought Jaws, Shark Attack, and they would have been, and people would have been happy with them as two yep. separate games. Yep. So I think the neatest part in this, like takeaway for me, is the way they mash these two together to do a campaign thing. I thought that was cool. Um, I got to play this more before I share more thoughts. I, I got to admit, it wasn't loud by it so far, but I've only tried the shark. I'll try the other way around. Yep. No, again, I, you know, I, I don't, again, it wasn't a bad game. Uh, it just, it was a one and done for me. I, I don't know. That happens. Yep. Now, right around when we were finishing up Jaws, uh, the huge Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Ziggurat finally got down to the final floor after 11 hours of play. I got to thank Dope for bringing that thing out. That got a lot of people's attention. Like I said, I know at least got one person into the store just from people sharing so, pictures. That so was just, quite epic. Just to, for a quick description for those uh, people uh, listening, it was a giant Mayan stepped pyramid where the actual levels of the pyramid physically came off to reveal the floor within. Uh, there was a giant spiral staircase running down the center of the first several floors uh, with corner staircases on the ends. Uh, and he had actually installed LEDs into the walls to act as torches within mm -hmm. the ziggurat. I mean, this was really something to see. Yeah, it was impressive. Plus, as, as Deanna points out, uh, the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition, which is a system the three of us yep. grew up on, basically. So that Absolutely. was pretty awesome. Yep. I would have loved to have played that, but I couldn't have been tied up for 11 hours. Yeah, no, I that definitely wouldn't have worked. So yeah, at this point, it's getting late. I, I was feeling rough. Every year, the auction takes a lot out of me, and this year was no exception. Um, I swapped to light games at this point. It was time for silly party games and kid games. And man, this is when I broke out Rhino Hero. And wow, I have never had a game of Rhino Hero go over as well as this game did. Uh, Tori, who you all know from our Gloomhaven videos, Tori gets a little weird when he gets tired, a little punch drunk. And wow, he was he was enthralled he, he by Rhino Hero. He, he obsessed may be a good word. Um, this is a kid's dexterity game where you're building an apartment, building out of cardboard walls, basically building a house of cards. And your goal is to play all your floors and be the player or be the player with the least floors when the tower topples. And all I have to say is no one ever ran out of floors and we must have played 10 games. I don't have great dexterity to begin with. I drink a lot of coffee and I'm very shaky. <laughs> Why I decided to play Rhino Hero is beyond me. Because when you add on the amount of tired I was and the amount of coffee I'd been yeah. drinking all day, it was just a poor choice for me. Yeah, the, this game kept coming back out. Uh, it was a hit each time. There was a lot of laughter. Um, something about lack of sleep and lots of coffee. It, it, oh, man, Rhino Hero. Uh, uh, the hero we deserve, as Tori would say. Um, yeah. Rhino Hero was a thing. Uh, sticking with the dexterity theme, the next game I grabbed was something a little bit more thinking, and that's Hamster Roll. Uh, we talk about this a lot on the show, on the podcast, on the blog, for good reason. This is still one of the best dexterity games ever made. I love Hamster Roll. What was fun at the event, though, is we learned just how uneven the table was at the CG Realm. Wow. Uh, what was fun with that, though, is we made it so the wheel was going uphill, and it was interesting because, man, you had to pile a lot of blocks on that before it moved. But then when, when it did move, did it ever roll? <laughs> Indeed. 
Uh, uh, we played so much hamster roll. I don't even know how many rounds we played. Yeah, at least three. I know. I know. I, I recorded three. I'm not sure if we we did more uh, more than that or not. Yeah, I know personally. Like the first couple rounds, I felt like I was a hamster roll master, like a dexterity game master. To I just fell apart, and I was just my personal goal was collect every single piece. I I think everyone loved hamster roll. That game always goes over well. Absolutely. So around this point, uh, the time change hit. This is one of the things that's uh, a highlight of our extra life every year, which actually I find a frustration. Glory eyed, we realized it was 1 a.m. again. Uh, At this point, I felt we needed something to kind of wake everyone up. So I went and grabbed my copy of But Wait, There's More. Um, I thought this would be good because it'd be a game that gets everyone talking and everyone involved. Uh, This is a game where the players are giving a product you at the pitch. You combine that with a feature card in your hands and you sell the product and infomercial style the neat part is that part way through your pitch you have to draw a card and say but wait there's more and add the new pitch to it the new um not pitch the new feature feature, new feature to your pitch after each round players are going to blind vote on whoever they think gave the best pitches it's it's an improv almost rpg thing you're going to do three product tally for votes see who wins no, absolutely. It's it's fun. I mean, if you're not a if you're with a, a group of people you're comfortable with and you can just let go and, and just be feel free to improv, uh it's it's absolutely enjoyable to just come up with the craziest oh, yeah. things and, and you can you can plan the first half of your speech, but the second one is coming out of uh the thin air. So you'd better be in, in, yeah. in and it really could depth. be out of almost anything. I mean the the, the possibilities are remarkable. I, I, I think it was a great way to wake everyone up, get everyone reinvigorated. Um, I haven't brought this game out in a long time, and man, I regret it. I got to start bringing this out to more public play events. I don't like a lot of party games in general, but this one I really like. We had a great time playing it Saturday night or Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday morning. I, I had a lot of fun with it, but wait, there's more. I think that was the first time Sean had ever even seen that yeah, game. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it is such a fun game. Yep. Uh, next was Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. As you can tell, we're sticking to the the lighter stuff at this point. We were all tired and yep. and cranky and everything that goes along with tired. Um, we've been playing Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters a lot, so that part was nice. That the rules were just really fresh in my mind. And just like I talked about last week, I said next time I bring this game out with nine with gamers, I'm skipping right to the advanced rules. That's what I did, and I'm glad I did. I, I love this game. Everyone who played it did it. Uh, you hadn't had a chance to try. No, this was my first time with the advanced rules. Uh, what do you think? And no, it's it's definitely fun. Um, and it's the 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 challenge is one of those. It's a co op that you're not going to beat most of the time. No, it, so it, you it, are it, not. It brings it to that gamer level where it's it's not a kids game you're going to beat if you if you do the right things. No, no, this is a gamer's game where you're probably going to lose even though it's co op. Yeah. And man, the frustration of those stupid doors. <laughs> <laughs> I love it though. I gotta admit, I only played one round of Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters, but the group kept playing. I don't know if you played two, one more or two more. Uh, I only played one more. I think they might have played one in the middle. Okay, so yeah, there might have been three more games. So what I decided to do then is set up a racetrack, because I gotta say, this is on a, pretty much an extra life tradition for me, is a 3 a.m. game of pitch car. Now, learning from the mistakes I made last time uh, at our warm-up event where I decided to make a really difficult track, I made things pretty simple this time. Um, there were a couple jumps, but they were nice, basic, straightaway jumps. We played a five-player game, and I was happy because I got Ian to play. Now, Ian was there overnight staffing the store. Thank you very much, Ian, for staying overnight. But he doesn't get into a lot of games, and it was good to get him involved. Yeah, I, I think, love Pitch Car. And everyone everyone had a great time. I think uh, everyone kind of got sort of roped into playing, even though we were all tired. It was like, yeah. oh, I don't want to stand up. But then everyone stood up and wa- stood around the table. It was a nice tall table which actually sort of helps you stay awake rather than leaning over or sitting down and, and flopping. Uh, and a good time was had by all, although I think that was kind of starting to uh, wind down for the most of us. Uh, yeah, that, this, this, that might have been the killing blow. Of our energy, I think. Now, I made things interesting. We used one of the variant rules, uh, which are, you know, I forget what I think I called it, the death track rule. But if you flick an opponent's car off the track, they go where you started. So that was fun. Actually, I think I'm going to use that guard game from now on. I mainly put that in because I thought it would encourage people to cheat, and it worked for that. So that was good. Um, now, while Tori may not be the best person to put a rhino meeple on a card tower, man, is he good at flicking crocodile-style cars around a track? Yep. Kicked our butt. Yep. 
Um, at this point, I thought it was time for something heavy. No, actually, it was Cat made the decision and broke out Operation. Uh, Tori and Cat won a copy of this during the live auction. Uh, they bought it mainly to support the cause, right? They were just mainly donating money. But Tori had never played it, and he wanted to play it. And at this point in the morning, it seemed like the perfect game. Now, what shocked me is this is not the Operation I played as a kid. The one I played was a game. This was more of an activity. When I played, you would flip up a bunch of cards equal to the number of players showing various ailments you had to cure. And they were worth different money depending on how difficult they were. And then you would try to do it. And if you failed, another person could be, no, I'm the specialist. They would volunteer. And if they succeeded, they got double the money. What that means is that there was some strategy and tactics. Like, for example, one of the tricks in the old game was to fail intentionally so you could try as the specialist and maybe get double money. All that's gone. There's no cards. You just pass the stupid thing around and try to make a pull, pull a bit out without it buzzing. If you do it, hey, you pass it to the next guy. Like, person. I, yep. I, I don't get it. Like, that, that's just... What's well, the and they even they even quieted down the buzzer, which is sort yes. of the, you know it used to be. I mean, when 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 we played the game as kids, if you touched the side, you jumped because oh, the yeah. thing screamed at you. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas at uh, in this one, you barely noticed there was a buzzer at all. You just had to look for the nose to light up. Yeah, you look for the nose. I no, I like I I feel bad for kids growing up with Operation these days. Like uh, that's not the Operation I remember. Now at this point, I went out and uh, and started, well, at least trying to uh, to nap a little bit in the uh, in the van out back. Yeah. While Sean was napping, um, we stuck to some lighter kid friendly games around here. Four or five a.m. I broke out King of the Dice from Haba. We've talked about this on the show. This is ages five plus. This went over pretty well. Uh, the interesting thing here is we had in the middle of the game a terrible spread of citizens partway through where every card in the tableau required six dice in certain patterns, and none of them overlap. So basically, you'd roll the dice once and pick which one you're going to go for and shot for the moon. That was interesting. So this game had a ton of scoundrels headed into doubt, and we actually, the game ended because the scoundrels ran out, which has never happened before. I, this wasn't bad or good. It was just a thing, and I thought it was neat to see that this was a thing in King of the Dice I hadn't seen before. Yep. Next, I took out a card game called Dead Man's Draw. I have the tabletop day version of this that I won at one of the Geek and Sundry events a few years back. Uh, this is a really neat pusher luck card game um, that I really like, and I kind of forgot I had it. When I was packing for Extra Life, I was like, oh, wait, Dead Man's Draw. So here I was, I grabbed it, whatever time in the morning it was, and I threw it out. And I got to admit, the first half of the game was, whoa, wait, what's that do? As we looked up stuff in the rule book, there was an awful lot of, what's that do? Because there's 10 suits. So I think 10 times I had to go, wait, what's that do again? But I, I think we had a pretty good time. We were just playing four player, I think. Still a good game. Dead Man's Draw, I got to admit, I, I I I need to bring that one back out. That was, that was a neat game. Um, and then from there... We went on to the final game or games of the day, night, morning, whatever the heck it was. The sun was up. It was bright. I remember that much. My eyes were blurry. I broke out concept. We've talked about concept every time we talk about gateway games, party games, games to play at pubs, babes playing with babe groups. I love concept. This is my favorite big group party game. It's an icon-driven word-guessing game. Um... The big thing is just toss out the rules. There are scoring rules. You throw that out. We play it as an activity. One player draws a card, tries to get everyone else to guess the concept. Then if that person, whoever guesses the concept is the person who's going to give clues next time. Uh, we had a whole crowd standing around. We had people sitting down playing, standing down playing. This one drew a pretty good crowd early in the morning. Or as, or as much as a crowd as it could in the, uh, the wee yeah. hours of the morning. Yeah, well, okay, big crowd compared to everything else we played. <laughs> Yep. Uh, at this point, it was probably around 8 a.m., which felt like 9 a.m. because of the time change. Deanna, thankfully, had shown up. She went home after doing a bunch of math and stuff after the auction and got some sleep. Uh, it was now time for me to tag team and let her take over while I got some sleep. So I'm going to pass this off to Sean because I don't even know what happened for the next little while. Uh, well, not unfortunately all that much. Uh, so uh, the War Machine Tournament... Uh, was a failure to start. I mean, and I Ouch. felt so bad for Steve uh, that he didn't get that going. 
but he had a bunch of prize support too. Like yeah. so that was that was unfortunate. And uh however, Solon, uh X Wing being what it is in Windsor, uh had a great tournament that uh he was all on top of. They did they had a great time. Uh but they're very self involved. So we we felt we kind of backed off a little bit and we weren't running uh, the draws and things during that because you don't want to interfere. It's a time yeah, tournament, a you know, tournament. time timed levels, a real tournament. Um, they take their game very seriously, uh, as they have every right to, and uh, so we we let them uh, go through that, and they had a fantastic time playing X Wing. Uh, but unfortunately, that was pretty close to uh, what was going on, uh, except for again before. Before Cat and Tori finally tagged out, uh, Anchi Games played a few games with them. Uh, apparently, uh, Batman Love Letter was played again. I was still I was still doing the occasional nap out in the in the in my oh. van in the back. So yeah, no. Deanna pointed out it's a bunch of games she normally wouldn't play, but Tori and Cat were into the place to play anything that, that yep. Deanna might have wanted. And, to play. and we can't forget Jeff's uh, 4 a.m. DCC yes. game. Uh, where he ran a level two dungeon for level zero characters, I believe it was, uh, in order to encourage cheating, and uh, turned in quite the profit on the cheat That's jar right. in order for them to stay alive. Uh, yeah, big thanks to Jeff and Sheila for showing up at 4 a.m. with savory foods in addition to uh, the sweets. That was a nice touch. That's something I called out on the blog, but probably worth mentioning here. Absolutely. And to whomever, we still don't know who, dropped off the spinach pastries. Thank yeah, you. Good, they were fantastic. Yeah, that was nice. So I had a much needed nap. I got back around 3 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, at that point, the X-Wing tournament was still going on. They were in the, the, the very end of it. Solon was doing his thing. Uh, there was a huge game of, but wait, there's more going on in one corner. That Holy cow, was that loud. Uh, the overnight D&D game had wrapped up. Uh, I gotta say, unfortunately, the store was pretty empty. Um, I can't really complain because of how many people we had on Saturday. But Deanna and I were talking about this, and I think part of the problem was our flyer said November 2nd, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. November 3rd. And I think if those were on separate lines, it might have been better. I think people saw November 2nd, 10 till 6. And that's what got stuck in their head. Like, even Jeremy had 6 o'clock stuck in his head. Yep. Yeah, so the D and D game ended around eleven ish. So yeah, they they I'm sure they got their twenty four hours in and more yep. because of the time change. Yeah, no. But absolutely. like to be honest, Sunday was just regular, except for Solon's tournament. There wasn't anyone there to for extra life that I really saw, unfortunately. Yep. So that's something to to learn from next year. Uh, personally, I was good to go at this point. I was hoping to show up and see a bunch of gamers. Uh, Jeff and Sheila were still there, so thankfully for that. They were up for playing a game, so I set up Veenhost Deluxe, excuse me, Veenhost Deluxe Edition. Ended up playing with Jeff and Sheila, as well as Chad. Uh, this, I think, I, I could be wrong here, but this is probably the heaviest game Jeff had ever played and Sheila had ever tried. So I did take a little longer with the teach than usual. I spent more time than usual explaining various terms and the effects of actions on top of just how they work. So it wasn't just the mechanics, more of the why. Um, also added some tips I've learned from previous plays, like make sure you always have at least a buck on hand or you might be forced to pass. Um, I do feel bad for this, but in the middle of teaching main hosts, I did have to interrupt because we did have some gamers show up and they were fumbling around. They took a look at Cthulhu, which I wasn't going to take the time to teach that, but then they grabbed Dead Man's Draw. Uh, so I went back to Dead Man's Draw and taught them how to play and played a quick round for them. So thanks Jeff, Sheila, and Chad for waiting while I took a break to play a game of Dead Man's Draw. Uh, Dead Man's Draw Awake was way better than Dead Man's Draw at 4 in the morning. Uh, yet again, that's a great push-your-luck game. So if, you, if you're if you looking for a push-your-luck card game, Dead Man's Draw is definitely up there. Then back to Venhos, uh, we did play five of the six rounds. And then we decided to pack the game up. Now, technically, the store was still open till 6. So they were open for another 45 minutes. But at that point, we were pretty much the only people in the store. And they'd already been open overnight for us. So I just wanted to be out of there on time. Um, the unfortunately short game of Venhost did go really well. Uh, Jeff's in the chat now confirming this. He seemed to be really loving it. Um, I think he's definitely digs the heavier games with this. Um, he noted in particular with Venhost, the theme was something he knew about and how that really helped to tie it in with the mechanics. And he liked how the mechanics and the theme integrated. He liked how it felt like every mechanic was there for a reason. 
And that reason could be tied to winemaking, right? So it just made, well, of course your stuff ages and slides. And of course, having a seller would make the value go up and not the quality and all this other stuff. I thought that was really neat. Uh, by six o'clock, we had everything packed out and we were out the door. So 33.5 hours, I think, after we showed up Saturday morning and left with over $5,000 collected. Yeah. No, and I have to say, when it comes to Vinos, while I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not the heavy gamer, the theme and the integration of the theme in Vinhos has actually sort of made me think, oh, if one of these times when we're actually when we actually have time to, you know, get the, yeah. the hours of play available that we don't usually ha necessarily have, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm I might be willing to sit down for that one. Yeah, and I, of all the heavy games, that and food chain magnet, I, the the themes are just very accessible that way, where food chain magnets though is really unforgiving. <laughs> that's the problem with like food chain magnet you're yeah. going to make some wrong decisions the first couple turns and be out of the game that's not going to happen in vino right vinos is definitely a, a simpler teach than most all right uh so uh look ahead what do you have planned for the coming week uh it's, you know what uh there should be a cg realm event i don't even know what we're doing for demos i gotta talk to ian it's already wednesday there's going to be an open gaming night saturday november 9th at cg realm I do know that our easy mode night on the 16th is going to be canceled. So I'm not sure what's going to be up with that. Um, I got a notice this morning again, I'm slightly under the weather, so I haven't caught up on all my emails, but I know easy mode has something else going on on the 16th. They've offered us the 17th to do a game night. I'm not sure if I'm free that Sunday to do it. So I don't know yet. Um, well, yeah, I know that's pretty much it. I, and I know we have some plays of uh, Horrified that we can uh, yeah, that we'll we be able to talk about, about as well. Next week we have more Minecraft and Horrified. More Minecraft, yep. So uh, I think we'll be able to give sort of a, a more complete review of both those games next week. Yeah, yeah Horrified and Minecraft we'll be talking about next week. Um, I got a bunch of stuff unboxed I want to play. That's the other thing is I want to get people over to play some of that stuff I opened up. All right. Just going to pop into the lobby real quick. And again, since we're here and they're here, I'd like to say again, thank you, Jeff and Sheila, for all your help uh, throughout the weekend and tech. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yes, uh, Vinhos is harder than Eclipse. Uh, yeah. Eclipse is a three. Oh, well, Eclipse is a three, six, nine, while Vinos is a four or a four, uh, uh, four, I, I, I four or five. Be, I think that's a pretty big jump, actually. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, there really is a curve in the hole. It's not it's it's not a linear one to five. It's yeah. there's definitely a curve once you hit once you pass two. Yeah, it's four point oh six for the Vino host we played. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Jeff did like it. So yeah, definitely the heaviest game he's played. Um, no, from Red Meeple Ryan. Yeah, Concept would be probably the least uh, vision impaired friendly game I've ever played or owned. Yeah, I don't think you could fix that one. Uh, and D mentions she actually got in Lanterns and Azul as well. Oh, there's some good uh, games during yeah. over the night. So I, I've never played Batman Love Lover. I probably shouldn't say anything bad about it. <laughs> Love Letter's not really my kind of game. No, what I'm I, I kept thinking after the fact is why didn't we play? Like, well, how did we not break out Imhotep with like Tori and Cat who have played it a hundred times at three in the morning? I, I'm just surprised by some of the stuff that didn't get played when I started packing them up. Well, I think because we were stuck on the kids' game yeah. concept. Uh, we'd all sort of dropped into uh, youngin mode. I wonder. I, part of me was like, "Let's bring out Venus," and I wonder if that would have worked. Like, uh, probably if a not. brain burner might have worked people up, woke people up. Right. Uh, so, so Ryan's mentioning the magic maze and the mind are less accessible. Oh, there you go. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. The mind. Did anyone play a card yet? Oh, you're not allowed to talk. Yeah, the yeah. mind would be okay. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's got to be pretty close. Concept. Concept. All you're allowed to say is yes. Right. You could, I guess you could listen to what the other players are saying and guess things along the same line. If everyone's like, okay, it's a movie and it, and it has it has a robot in it, you know, you could at least be playing part of it. <laughs> so that's it. We knew that Tori ah, would right. not be able to stop saying Imhotep. Right. That's probably true. Fair enough. All right. Well, thanks again to the lobby as we move on.